Can you volunteer? Can you volunteer to lead us in opening prayer? Let, let us pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We worship you. We adore you. We lift your name high above every other name. We worship you because you are God and you are the only true God. We thank you for leading us throughout the day and till this hour. We have come to study. We pray for divine wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And your servant whom you are going to use, we pray for more knowledge. As we study, let the word dwell in us and let us put them into practice. And let your Holy Spirit take over whatever we are going to do from this moment. In the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for coming for tonight's lecture. Uh, we are going to, um, without wasting further time, to go into our lecture for the evening. <clears throat> Let me share my slide. Um, yesterday we started on We started on the teaching methods and principles. Teaching principles and methods. Today we are going to continue from where we stopped last week. Now we look at while we're looking at it, we looked at the importance of teaching in the life of the church. Um, we saw that while, while preaching is limited to the confine of the pulpit and also in its formality, in its structure and timing, we saw that teaching, on the other hand, um, create avenue for more exploration, it creates avenue for more discovery, it creates avenue for more interaction. Uh, we define teaching. We say that teaching by its nature gives avenue for instruction, explanation, and uh, it also gives avenue for equipment, equipping the people who have been taught. Today we are going to progress in our, in our thought by looking at Holy Spirit as a teacher. The Holy Spirit as a teacher. Um, uh, by way of beginning, we need to point it clear that teaching cannot effectively take place without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two um, supernatural elements that are involved in teaching. The first one is the Word of God which is referred to as the divine content the divine content now we also have the holy spirit which we refer to as a divine communicator and enabler divine communicator and enabler um, the word of god is the divine content the holy spirit is the divine communicator and enabler now we have already emphasize the necessity of teaching God's word as the content. We now look briefly on how the Holy Spirit empowers us and as human to convey the biblical truth. Now when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we are not trying to eliminate the need for human teachers, but we are trying to emphasize the fact that the Holy Spirit makes the effect makes the effort of the human teachers more effective. Now, the Holy Spirit converts. The Holy Spirit made the human work of human teachers 
more effective. Now, when we look at the characteristics of a good teacher, what are the characteristics of a good teacher? Number one, a good teacher is totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. A good teacher must totally depend on the Holy Spirit. Why will you depend on the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit gives us um, several... Uh, a, a good teacher must also be one who um, who is an example of what he or she teaches. Must be an example of what he or she teaches. A good teacher must be one who is a diligent student and also a diligent preparator. You must study diligently, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A good teacher must be transparent and open-minded. Must be transparent and open-minded. In other words, a good teacher is one who is not closed up. You close up, you don't allow avenue for the Holy Spirit to come and teach you, give you insight. Must be open-minded. The good teacher must be humble and servant-like in attitude. Of course, we have been called to serve. We have been called to serve. So we must develop that servant-like aptitude as teachers. Remember why it must be so? Because uh, you must be an example, or one must be an example of what one teaches. A good teacher must cultivate and maintain a teachable spirit with a consideration of Christ as the teacher. Christ is our teacher, so we must follow that suit. A good teacher must also rest on the scripture as the focal. Now, when we look at the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gives us ability to discern error, why must we depend on the Holy Spirit? It gives us ability to discern error. It gives you the ability to know the truth from error. When you see error, you flee from error. When you see truth, you embrace the truth. In First John chapter 2, verse 20, 26, and 27, the Bible says, And He gives us anointing, which is the spirit of truth, to help us and to guide us. And the Holy Spirit teaches and guides us into truth, revealed in the Word of God. John 14, 26, and John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. Guide us into all truth. Open our mind to understand and accept God's word as the truth. Empowers our message. Enable us to obey, obey the truth and make our teaching productive. The Holy Spirit makes our teaching productive. So when we want to look at the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, first of all, we look at the personal perception of a teacher. Now there are four uh, cardinal perceptions of a teacher. Number one, a teacher is a guide. A teacher is a guide. Guide people into truth. Guide people into righteousness. Guide people into holiness. Guide people into purity. You are a guide. Guide to those who are blind. Guide to those who come to church looking for who will help them. So as good teachers, we are guide to them. A good teacher is also a motivator. Is a motivator. Who is a motivator? A motivator is one who motivates, who encourages, uh, who inspires uh, people to take several uh, action. To take several positive action. A good teacher must be an encourager. Must be an encourager. Encourage the downcasted. Encourage those who are weary. Encourage those who mourn. Encourage those who are having difficulties. So a good teacher ought to be an encourager. Last but not the least, a good teacher is a sower. So in the morning, so in the evening, you don't know when uh, the food will come there off. So a good teacher is a sower. Remember the story of the parable of a uh, sower who went to sow some field on sunny ground, some, uh, sunny ground, some rocky ground, some fertile ground, and so on and so forth. So a good teacher is one who prepares such a person 
who prepares such a person to enter into an office. So a good teacher is a sower. Is a sower. Now, um, uh, perception of students. What are the perception of students towards a good teacher? Students see a teacher as a discoverer, as one who discovers. Discoverer. Discoverer. Either you discover from the scripture or discover from a godly book, discover from one act or the other. So a good teacher is a, 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 a discoverer. Uh, now, the students see him as a discoverer. So now, for, okay, the teacher uh, sees the student as discoverers, I beg your pardon. The teacher prepares the student to be discoverers. Number two, they are learners. Perception of the teacher to the student is that they are learners. They are learners. They are ready and willing to learn, willing to understand principles, willing to understand things that will help them to uh, be up and do it. Now, also harvester. The teacher sees uh, the student as harvesters. We know the work of a harvester. Those who go to harvest crops, and when they go to harvest crops, they harvest the good ones, the bad ones, they lay it aside. So that way they have become useful in their family. So in, uh, with that picture in mind, a good teacher is a harvester. One who harvests, one who gathers, one who makes a um, home library, one who motivates and guides. So a good teacher is also um, perceive his students as having potential. You see them as people that have potential, people who have gift without limit, uh, people who have gift that can service God and humanity, people who has a uh, uh, ministry that they have been using to glorify the name of God. So it is a place of a good teacher to uh, see such a person as having potential and locate them uh, appropriately. Um, that is a perception of the teacher towards uh, uh, the students. Now, um, uniqueness of an outstanding teacher. What are the uniqueness of an outstanding teacher? Number one, every outstanding teacher is one who has been equipped by study. You are equipped by study. That means that teacher must be one who is uh, studying, who is uh, spending time days and night to study. So when you come in the morning, you not give them what you gave them two weeks ago. You not preach or teach what you taught two weeks ago. You come down very fresh, very anointed, very liberated to share the word of life among God's people. So a good teacher is one who is equipped by God by study. Number two, a good teacher is one who is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The teacher must have surrendered himself or herself to the Holy Spirit, to the power of the Holy Spirit. The teacher must have been subjected himself to that grace, that sufficient grace, that extraordinary grace that has changed life, changed destinies, changed people's future. So uh, the, the, the a teacher is equipped by study. Number two, the teacher is equipped, empowered by the by the Holy Spirit. The teacher is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to guide us, to comfort us. The Holy Spirit is there to endure on us. And after endowing on us, they will set exam to others. The Holy Spirit uh, equip, we are equipped by the by empowered by the Spirit. Number three, excited about teaching. Every good teacher must be excited. Baby said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of God. There must be that element of excitement, that element of joy when a teacher uh, derives as a result of engaging with the students. Number five, expect them for God uh, to transform the life of the students. A good teacher must expect God to transform lives, expect God to do amazing things through lives, expect God to bring dramatic changes, to bring dramatic changes. 
in the life of the people that he or she is teaching. Now, the fundamental principles of teaching. Genuine teaching will occur. There are certain things that will happen before a genuine teaching will occur. Number one is uh, the teacher. Focus on the teacher. A focus on the teacher. Focus on the teacher is the first principle. Now, uh, when we say uh, focus on the teacher, what the teacher should not do, what the teacher should not do, and what the teacher should do. When we are focusing on the teacher, we are talking about what the teacher should not do. So, number one, the teacher should not preach. Uh, teach the principles and tradition of men in the place of God's truth. Don't teach the principles of men and traditions of men in place of God's truth. So what the teacher should do is to go and teach the word of God and the word of God alone. Don't teach false or strange doctrine not granted in the, in the word of God. Don't teach false doctrine not granted in the word of God. Don't teach false doctrine, not granted in the word of God. Um, you can see that in first uh, Timothy chapter 6 verse 3. Don't be overly interested to controversial questions. A good teacher must not be interested in controversial questions. Controversial questions are questions that the answers are endless. The answers do not come now because there are a lot of controversies, argument about it. The answers do not come. So a teacher should not engage himself in controversial question, controversies. A teacher should not engage himself or herself in being ashamed for the word of God or for the gospel. Don't be ashamed. Jesus said, if you are ashamed before me, I'll be ashamed before, I will ashamed about you before the Father who is in heaven. So the teacher he should be one who is of being fearful. Don't be fearful. Number six, not to engage in godless chatter. Uh, no, don't, be, uh, don't be ashamed or apologize for the word of God. A true teacher should not be ashamed or apologize for the word of God. Don't be ashamed. Don't apologize for the word of God. Then the last but not the least, do not quarrel with people you teach. Don't quarrel with people you teach. Don't, don't have everything, anything to do with uh, godless meat and, and the old wine fable. Godless meat and old wine fable. All those things that do not add fable, they do not add value, they do not add eternal value. To the life of our ministers and associates. So, the, the request does not have value. So, when we talk about what the teacher should do, number one, handle the word of God, handle the word of truth. Make sure you understood or you understand what you are teaching and those who you satisfy fit to teach. Make sure you understand what you are doing. What are you teaching them? What are you you abandon them? What are you dreading them? So uh, that's the next one. The other one is uh, what you're watching closely. What you're watching closely. So there's every need for the teacher to watch his watchings closely. Watch your watchings closely. Um, so the teacher should focus on all this. Now the next one is the learner. What should the learner do? What should the learner do? Have you seen some of the things that the teacher should do? Um, the, the seven principles of teaching uh, rotate around teacher, learner, language, uh, lesson, uh, teaching poses, teaching poses, and uh, review. However, when we talk about learning, Learning. What are the things to learn? 
the learner must stimulate the student interest in subject matter so it is our place as teachers to stimulate interest sometimes you uh, claim that why you are teaching the slept why you are teaching the slept why you are teaching and uh, on monday morning they they left or they slept so it's now a place to stimulate interest to ensure that that sleep does not come it doesn't come at when it should come so the teacher uh, will focus on the learner the learner uh, the teacher should teach something that will spark interest for appropriate uh, appropriate uh, people to maintain the school's history and figurative weight. Number two, the the number two to convey excellence and enthusiasm for the subject. To confess excellence and create enthusiasm for the subject. Yes, yeah, there's need for enthusiasm to be created, hunger to be created, excellent spirit to be created. So when they are created, whoever that is going to collect we connect to what has been created. So the language must use words that are known by the people, the students. Words that are known by the students are words that should use. The next one is uh, the 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 language. The language. The language is also very very critical. The language is very very critical very important very important very important so after the language we have the 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 next one is the the learner the learner the learning process uh, teachers must maintain working to uh, students to hold and hours so commit them to hours of reading hours of intensive prayer our hour of worship. They have to be educated that there is need to create that hour, to create it, to create avenue whereby uh, they will interact and involve in activities. Um, the most knows of the teacher. What are the most knows of the teacher? There are certain things which we have called the most knows of a teacher. A teacher must know these things. A teacher must hear this thing. A teacher must understand this thing. Now, when we may insisted on she's being the uh, venue, the, uh, we said what he must know. He or she must know what is what is what he or she teaches and contents. He must know what you teach. The teacher must know what you teach and what are the contents of what he teaches. So marriage the lesson and church marriage so number one he or she must know uh, what he or what he or she believes that is the content he or she must know who is teaching student the first when you know the content when you know the student and uh, therefore the teacher must not engage long uh, cognizance of, of the following who we'll go to a church and take long, the reasons are not fast for They are not far first. Number one, uh, common self to be a teacher. Uh, consider self to be a teacher. While he is waiting, he considers self, self, self to be a teacher. He's a teacher, and once he wants, everything is over. So, um, he or she must know who she is uh, teaching. You must know who you are teaching, know your audience. The first one is to know the, the content. The second one, know the audience. Know the audience. Who are the audience? What are the makeup of the audience? What are their compositions? What are their occupations? So that's what we mean by knowing the people by names. Number three, uh, must know uh, if she or he is teaching, uh, is teaching. Must know whether the rector is teaching, whether the rector is teaching or just doing administrative activities. So, uh, yes. Number four is to, to therefore the teacher must be serious. Take cognizance of teachers. The teacher must be serious. Take cognizance of teaching. 
take cognizance of the following. Consider self to be a learner. Consider self, the teacher must consider self to be a learner. Not only consider self to be a learner, study uh, diligently to thoroughly understand the subject matter. Everything you want to teach, you must thoroughly understand them, thoroughly understand them, thoroughly digest them, thoroughly look on to God as personal and savior for them. Then uh, study diligently to understand the subject matter mentioned. Awareness of the previous knowledge and capacity of each of the students. You know, what you do is that when you want to teach, you recall what happened previously, what happened previously, and their response. Is this something that will delay the marriage? Is this something that will uh, put a, a pen, stop it to the marriage? Definitely not. But uh, there is every need that uh, he knows who is taking assignment. Therefore, the new teacher must take uh, serious cognizance of satisfaction, serious cognizance of the following. Consider self to be a teacher, study to show oneself approved, awareness of previous meetings, environment to respond positively, um, remember that teaching creates iconic relationship between the lawgiver and the law. Uh, uh, the, the teaching does that. Teaching does that. Uh, now, to stimulating of student interest. What are the things to do to stimulate their interest? Number one, earnestly see uh, spark interest, spark main interest in the content. Earnestly spark main interest, spark main interest. Let it hungry you that in your time there was a sparking of interest, sparking of interest. Number two, consider use consequently are uh, the most appropriate means to maintain and deeply engage the students, uh, uh, student interest, such as question and answers, dialogue and challenges. So the teacher must be up to date in this regard, lifting up the be up, and so on and so forth. Then, uh, regularly demonstrate the importance of capacities of what each is being taught. What are the capacities of those being taught? What are their makeup? What are their social constructs? What are their plans? What are their programs? So, uh, so that is the next point. The last but not the least, imagine, imagine create as unknown conducive to students' movement. So the known created this deliberately. So when the chips are down, it will be one. And if it's one, it will be a kind of guide to other future users. To be a guide to future users. The the rule of engagement or body language when we are teaching there are rules of engagement there are body language we need to exhibit to make the mention uh, mention of that to work stronger to work stronger to work white higher now the ways used in teaching must be a, a peculiar to both the teacher and the subject they, they were in the city. When Jesus went, one of the things he was told to turn water, water into well. Turn water into well. Cause it into well. So, having said that, it's important that we refresh our mind on what, uh, uh, what preaching method is and what it is not. And uh, here we have come to see that the rule engagement, number one rule of engagement is the words and uh, touching, uh, the words used in watching must be familiar with both the vendor and the church. The wonder and the church must die a certain number and they discuss. And after discussing, uh, it will uh, be back the property of the church. So number three, uh, he or she must ensure that we teach it. 
both are on the same page. Understand that all of them need to understand each other, understand what is done, understand everything. Uh, number four, uh, propose fully defend a surgeon and raise the tunnel on raise on several occasions uh, to prayerfully define and create avenue prayerfully the key word is prayerfully prayerfully decide prayerfully consult the social class and decide for the young man so I will not continue to move to and fro like every wind of doctrine number five um, accept ambiguous push goes far distance for different places go far distance for different places go far distance for different places so when they did not go uh, further for he praises he praises the honor the adoration and thanksgiving so number six um the and the words and he, um, the words are evident or collegia demonstrated the collegia must be demonstrated and the walls are um, they have ears now for the rules of engagement um, we see various rules of engagement various rules against the both of these mental net bodies mental Paul persuading the disciples to go on and change in Acts chapter 6 while he was working a young uh, person came and met him and he heard the voice that this is the voice of the PC. He heard this is the voice of the PC. That's what, what that young child said. This is the voice of the PC. So I just kept quiet and did as if I didn't know. So and all these things are involved incentive, giving quiet incentive, giving quiet incentive, carry Jesus on any medium of transport to go for some expenses. Number three, get a point on a uh, second, get a point on a second, and what is that on the second is that there's going to be a massive turnout, people returning to come and give praise to what God has done, giving God praise for what he's doing, and giving God praise for how he's going to establish. Um, he went a course as a mother, ma, uh, as a mother, as one who didn't want the child to see the light of the day, now he has come with a game with Victoria that will see the light, Victoria, before the light of the day. May God help you both in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, um, um, strive to teach from the known to the unknown. The teacher must strive to teach from the known to the unknown. The teacher must try to teach from the known to the unknown and connect to the previous knowledge, the previous thing that was taught. So when you want to teach, you ensure you connected to the previous uh, knowledge, uh, connect to it, prioritize connecting each lesson to the previous ones. Ensure that the one you are teaching at the, at the moment is connected to the one you have uh, taught previously. So it's important that the teacher connect the present to the past. And also, each new idea should be presented logically and gradually. Each new idea presented logically and gradually. Each new idea present logically. Have a systematic way of presenting, making your logic, making your logic count. And also, an experience that ups the object lesson Parable and common day life are used. They are used in the context of this teaching. Every day lives of uh, teaching are used during this teaching period. Rules of engagement as well. The necessity for teachers to motivate students to think and learn outside the box. Push them to think and learn outside the box. Give them tough assignments, difficult questions, difficult puzzles, difficult areas give to them. Um, also, the urgency requires this creating an every environment that promotes self-learning. Yes, an every environment needs to be created for learning to occur. It must be created for learning to occur. Um, 
is a spirit that the teacher engages the student with thought provoking questions and challenging questions and engage with them with thought provoking questions it could be questions that have been asked before you ask it in another way thought provoking questions and thoughts that have passed uh, here before it it is reminded that seeds of uh, seeds of thought that the student can have be planted have the seeds of thought every child of god every god fearing person manifests the gift of thought and when a person uh, is gone and no more the people now use the gift and start uh, diluting it and start mixing it so uh, they need that it is where that seeds of thought that the uh, uh, the teacher connect the thought with the harvest connect the thought with the harvest it's also a spirit that students are preached and considered and discovered they should be discoverers they should be discoverers they should be discoverers so um, being a discoverer is important also um, the teacher the teaching process must lead students to reproduce their own mind as a result of teaching we have talked about God putting potential in everyone and they all have a mind, they have a will, they have a intellect. The potential is for you to uh, clean the mind, uh, satisfy it, and pour uh, whatever you need. So it will be a place that is uh, ready for one to use. The teaching process must ensure that it is behind the truth and other concept truth. The truth will have been left. The truth has been left. Uh, teaching process in, in, emphasizes teaching and understanding. Yes, there is need for teaching and understanding, question and answer, evaluation. Finally, there is evaluation. Evaluate on the basis of 1 to 10. So they evaluate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 10. So evaluate in the context of their works, in the context of their faith, in the context of their commitment, in the context of their nonchalant attitude, yes, we need to confess, uh, confess them and command them to change all their fears. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So for this, I'm going to pause for now and allow us to take some questions. Let's pause for now and take some questions. Any questions so far? Any question? Any question or any comment? No question, no comment. Okay. Any other person? Any comment? Are you all muted? Any comment? We have just highlighted in this study the place of the Holy Spirit. And we said that the Holy Spirit is in uh, the Holy Spirit accompanies us in, in this journey of teaching. The Holy Spirit accompanies us in this journey of teaching. In the teaching journey, we looked at the Holy Spirit as a um, as uh, having the two supernatural uh, and divine element involved in a, 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 a Bible teaching. And the first supernatural element is the Word of God and also the Holy Spirit. So we are able to see the Holy Spirit as giving us ability to discern error. So when you are, when you journey with the Holy Spirit, it gives you ability to discern error. Whenever people are preaching error, it is only by the Holy Spirit you know this person is going astray. The Holy Spirit teaching and guiding us into all truth. 
The Holy Spirit opened our mind. The Holy Spirit imparted the message. The Holy Spirit endeavoring us or enabling us to uh, obey the truth. We obey the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot obey the truth. So we see the Holy Spirit, we also between the Holy Spirit, the teacher and the student. The relationship between the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives understanding, insight and empowerment to the teacher. While the teacher imparts knowledge and skills to the student, then the student uh, connect to understanding, acceptable and enablement. That is uh, what the Holy Spirit does. I will look at the characteristics of a good teacher. We say a good teacher of Gentiles uh, must rule on the Holy Spirit, must rely on the Holy Spirit, must rely on the Holy Spirit, must study and prepare adequately. Study and prepare adequately. When you study and prepare adequately, the Holy Spirit will use you. Also, the Holy Spirit uh, has a humble, irrelevant attitude. There is an attitude that we need to copy from the uh, uh, issue gate. So, then the Holy Spirit challenges students to think for themselves. He challenges us to think for ourselves. So, when you see yourself thinking for yourself, as very well is the Holy Spirit around you. The Holy Spirit teaches us. He teaches us. Even when we are not prepared, He teaches us. The Holy Spirit also, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is a deliverer, delivers. The Holy Spirit is uh, a learner, learner. The Holy Spirit is also uh, a subject himself to university education. University education. So I'm going to pause for now again and ask another question. Um, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we we're talking about the place of Holy Spirit in the uh, teaching. Um, I wanted to find out. You know, we have some uh, doctrine, you know, beliefs that vary from one church to the other. I wanted to say. Okay, very, very good question. Very good. Incidentally, uh, you'll be doing a church history with Reverend Obio. I, I think he'll be teaching on Friday on church history. And also, he'll be teaching on doctrine. His course will play a very big role in answering some of these questions. So, I want to beforehand invite all of us, encourage you to attend his lecture. You will enjoy his lecture tomorrow and Friday. I can assure you that the new director, you will enjoy it. So, but why I say that, let me also say this, that uh, just like when you have, uh, if you buy ingredients for half and soup and give to an Igbo woman to cook half and soup, you buy ingredients for half and soup and give to an ethnic woman and you buy ingredients for half and soup and give to a dough woman. You buy ingredients for half and soup and give to someone from Yoruba and ask them to cook. Even if they have 
the recipe. They have they have the method or methodology on how to cook the soup. Someone has given them. I can assure you that after cooking it, it will not be the same. Because Kalaba woman will be cooking half and soup from her own perspective, Ibo woman will be cooking from her own perspective, Edo woman her own perspective. That is how the church doctrine is. All of them are carrying the Bible, but they are all interpreting from their own different perspective. Church history will help you to understand what led to division of churches. Churches divided, and when they divided, they started pursuing different orientations, different kinds of thinking, different kinds of thought. It happened at, the, at an age in church history when there was this kind of division, when this division occurred, Anglicans would do their own their own way, Lutherans would do their own way, Methodists would do their own their own way, and so on and so forth. All churches would do their own the same way because of uh, what happened in the Torah of Babel. Torah of Babel was an uh, opportunity that opened their eyes to this kind of reality. So it's not as if God is the one making mistakes. It is because each of them have uh, their own idea on how to join online course. And in the course of using their own idea, they miss it. They don't go to the same place to call the same material. Why A will go to A material, B will go to B material. I don't know whether you get the answer correct. Hello? Yeah, okay, I'm hearing you. So that is a one factor. For instance, church history where there was where uh, at the point where there was division of churches division of churches each churches went their own way with the same different orientation different thinking different understanding when they had different understanding but the same bible but different understanding so that is why i use an analogy of uh, of the woman who prepares soup she has a lot of how to prepare soup and possibly she prepares it will be watery another person will come and prepare it will be thick another person will come and prepare it will be semi watery and semi thick that is what happened when um, at some point when there was division in churches you will hear more ab about that in church history which will come on Saturday so let me not go into the, the, the church history so that you prepare very well warm up yourself to join that course okay thank you for that um as a follow-up question uh, i want to also add ask, ask this uh, if you look at the study bible for instance um if you're familiar with that there are some studies um, maybe a passage in the bible you go to the study portion and try to read to understand what that area is talking about. Sometimes you will see uh, about three options or more explaining that particular passage from the study, uh, you know, uh, perspective. Now, now this is not different churches. Now I'm just talking about the Bible. Let me say NIV or any Bible. I I, I know you you must have witnessed that. Just looking at the study portion, you will see, okay, the writers try to say, okay, maybe what Apostle Paul is saying is this. They give you that option. And number two, they say, maybe what he's saying is this. They give you that option. Number three, they say, maybe what he's trying to explain is this. They give you that option. Now, are we saying that there is no sufficient revelation on that particular portion that could enable one to understand the right from that passage in the Bible. Okay, thank you very much. That is a very, very, very important question that you have asked. And to answer that question, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I think verse, is it verse 12 or verse 13? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse... Uh, uh, Verse 12 or verse 13. Let me open it and see what is there. The Bible says in that portion that we know in part and we prophesy in part. 
we know in part and we we prophesy in part look at in verse in verse um, 9 see we know in part and we and we prophesy in part for when that which is perfect is come that which is past shall be done away when i was a child i speak as a child i understood as a child i thought as a child when i became a man i put away childish things no it, my emphasis is on verse 9 that says we know in part and we prophesy in part i thank god for those commentators um you know the the good thing about commentators when they are commenting they don't tell you this is what the holy spirit said they say uh, they say it as if it is their opinion they say it that they you know because there are many things about the bible that human mind cannot comprehend let me give you an instance when paul said a thorn in the flesh was given to him some argued that that thorn in flesh was a little stomach he used to have little pain um, others say that it was eye problem so but there's no definite no definite uh, meaning nobody can come authoritatively and say this is the meaning everything that they are um, arguing there whether they say it is um, a eye problem or nose problem or heart problem uh, of course some say that uh, because of poor consistent sick sickness that was why uh, Luke was you know Luke was a medical doctor that was why Luke was joining him in his missionary journey so that Luke would be his personal medical doctor but when you look at Paul the same Paul was a Paul who was bringing out handkerchief from his body eh? when he bring handkerchief from his body and, and thoughts of people they will be healed you begin to wonder how come can you reconcile between someone who sang as if was healing people and uh, the same person going with medical doctor in all the street so what i want to tell you is that we know in part and we prophesy in part everything you see in commentary are mere guide don't take it hook line and sinker rather what i will always advise is that whenever you go to any bible passage Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you new understanding, new insight, fresh insight to that portion of the Bible. So when the Holy Spirit gives you that insight, that will be your rema for the day. But when you don't have insight, you can consult commentaries. Commentaries and end, end just to be a guide, to be a guide. They are not end to be the, uh, the main truth. So they are not meant to be a main truth. You can still see a message in a commentary and when you look at it you are not convinced that that is what god said about that passage you discard it you disregard it so in a nutshell i'm saying that first corinthians 13 verse 9 says we know in part and we prophesy in part even commentary even some preachings we know in part we prophesy in part even those who prophesy in the church say thus say the lord they know in part and they prophesy in part Alright, thank you, um, man of God. And then that brings me to the last question. Um, now that we know in part, um, our understanding is passion. So, how do we approach messages that come and maybe say, oh, God said, and, uh, you know, and prophecies. So, can we now, if you use that passage now, first of all, we got some of those prophecies, messages, as suspicious first. That is to say, we place it in a condition where, okay, if it happens, we believe it. If it doesn't happen, we believe it. Because the person that is prophesying or speaking goes in part and uh, understanding will be partial. So, if we now approach it from that point, where then with the faith, our faith coming? Okay. Because we can assume that the person that is speaking has a partial understanding of what he's saying. And we also know that there have been prophecies that have been spoken and it didn't come to pass. So okay. how do we now differentiate these two? Thank you. 
Okay, maybe let me put that we know in part and prophesy in part in the right perspective. The right perspective is that even as I am teaching now, even what I'm teaching now, um, as 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 a counsel of God, when we say we know in part, we prophesy in part is that of, of all what I have known about God is not up to one third of what God is all about. Everything I know about God, I cannot claim to have known, say, 99% of God. So everything I know about God, even all of us that are gathered, is not even up to a fraction of who God is. So every, every knowledge we have acquired about God, that is why the Bible says, My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As heaven is higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways and God's thought higher than our thought. But that does not mean that what we are prophesying is not correct. So don't get it twisted. We are not saying that even when we know in part, it doesn't mean that we cannot prophesy the, uh, the mind of God. You can teach the mind of God, but everything we are teaching is not a, the embodiment of the mind of God. That is why as a scholar, it is now your place to go to go back and study deeper. The teacher must have taught, after teaching, it is the place of the audience to go and study deeper, to go and research deeper, like the Berean Christian, to find out if what the teacher said is so. In the course of your discovery, you may even discover more than what the person who have taught you have taught. So that is why when we say we prophesy in part, what I have done this night is just part of the whole picture but your wider study can help you to have a wider picture what you see in commentaries yes greater percentage of them may be correct but it is your place to go and dig deeper and study wider so you can see the wider truth that is why some people when they pick commentary a matthew henry commentary they pick another commentary they compare notes when they compare notes they say, from what I'm seeing in Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry may be right here. Eh? Then um, um, Bruce may be wrong here. Then you now pick it and through your own research, you now form your opinion or your, your the Holy Spirit will help you to form an opinion of what you think that God is saying in that place. Remember that God will speak, God might speak in a text. Give three different people different message of that text. So, that is why we say we know in part. We know in part means that what God re re reveals to me as Okoha is not the same thing he reveals to you as I Kokoro. He may reveal to you I Kokoro something different that is peculiar to you and reveal to me something different that is peculiar to me. That way, I know in part. He has revealed to me what he did not reveal to, to you and he revealed to you what he did not reveal to me. But that does not mean that the one I have uh, been revealed to cannot be taken as the word of God. It can be taken. But that is not the entire message. There are still things that audience can dig deeper and draw from God, which I was not able to draw from God. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. In fact, um, I'm trying to explain this, answer the last question I wanted to ask. Which is of the same passage, for instance, and have different interpretation from the Holy Spirit, depending on who is involved. Uh, I remember this passage. Yes. Uh, have you done a okay? Have you done a course on Bible study method and interpretation? Bible study method and interpretation. And interpretation. Have you done it? No. What course did the, this person handle? Okay, I'm going to handle the course. Personal spiritual life. Okay, we are going to do a course on Bible study method and interpretation. Then, when we do that course, we are going to journey you into different ways of interpreting the Bible. How we interpret the Bible. How do we approach a text? Number three basic ways of interpretation. How do you interpret? Number one, we say observe the text, interpret the text, and apply the text. 
So when you want to interpret a Bible passage, you observe it. There are rules. There are many rules on how to observe the text. Then we say interpret. There are many rules on how to interpret. The last one is apply. There are many rules on how to apply. So after this course, we will go into Bible study method and interpretation. We will do that. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So any other question from anyone? Only one person talking tonight. Any question, any comment? Elder Joe, Elder Joe, any comment, any question? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. I don't know what you said. I do like that. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not good for somebody to just um hold on to one point that has been given to him by your history he should, he should be a woman magic also uh embrace more that revelation from uh other people uh, uh, and, uh other relation to other people to other people uh, then like so we will be able to uh, become more balanced so we will see who the most of the particular uh revelation Yeah, yeah. Of course, when you do, they, you do a study on Bible doctrine survey. Bible doctrine survey. Bible doctrine survey will help you to um, the 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 ten ten major doctrines of the Bible. Ten major doctrines of the Bible. When you do that, ten major doctrines of the Bible. One of the things we are going to do about inspiration. I don't want to preempt that. We will start that course tomorrow with Reverend Pope University. So, however, I must warn that uh, uh, no matter how we talk about revelation, there are some revelation that God gives to people and they want to make it general. We must be careful not to make a revelation that God has given specifically to one person, general. God might give a revelation to me. I want me to apply it personally to myself and I want to generalize it to others. We should also be careful not to generalize personal revelation in as much as we should be open to the Holy Spirit but don't generalize personal revelation okay uh, Uche to by any comment we already it should be beyond our time okay who is iPhone any comment okay um, I Uche to lead us in closing prayer our sister gets you to the years closing prayer. She's not there. Okay, and they the leaders in closing prayer. Let us pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the teaching tonight. Holy Spirit, being a guide and a teacher, you have directed us aright. You have inspired us tonight. We pray for your continual guidance, even as we continue teaching. And let all of us, even as we go to bed, go in good strength and wake up in good strength. We continue to pray for the resource person, so God. Father, but not to bless him with more wisdom, even on this sacrifice, but not to see him through and bless him in good health. 
the name of Jesus. But I thank you. Amen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.